So this is the fourth Lorna Castleton Memorial Lecture. Lorna Castleton was a professor of fungal genetics and a fellow of St Cross, who sadly died in February 2014. She was a fellow of St Cross since 1993, elected a fellow of the Royal Society in 1999 and CBE in the 2012 birthday honours. The Lorna Castleton Memorial Fund was established by the college in her memory with the support of her family and friends, and as always, we're delighted that they're able, some of them are able to be with us here tonight, and supports the student scholarship and this annual lecture series. The inaugural lecture was given by Sir Paul Nurse, and we've had other wonderful lectures from Ada Jonas and last year, Ellen Stofan, and I'm sure some of you were here for that as well. Tonight, we're absolutely delighted to have with us Professor Fei-Fei Lee, Professor Lee is an Associate Professor at the Computer Science Department at Stanford University and Director of the Stanford Artificial Intelligence Lab and the Stanford Vision Lab, and also associated with Google. Her area of specialism is computer vision, and tonight she's going to talk to us about artificial intelligence, a deeply human pursuit. The talk will last for around an hour, and then we will, as I said, have time for questions. So, Professor Lee, we're delighted to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, coming to Oxford for me is a return after um, more than 15 years, 2002, under the generous invitation of Professor Andrew Sisserman sitting here, I actually visited uh, Oxford as a uh, PhD student. And I remember this is where I get to work on my first computer vision research paper. So, so I have a very, very fond memory of uh, Oxford. And thank you for inviting me again. And uh, today I want to share with you some of my most uh, recent thoughts after almost a two-decade uh, career in, uh, art in the area of artificial intelligence and hope to convince you that as much as it's a field called artificial intelligence, there isn't much artificialness in it. It's a very, very deeply human pursuit. Um, so without further ado, I'll, I'll get started. AI has risen with dizzying speed in recent years and we're witnessing all-in uh, commitment from every corner of the world, from business, billions of dollars from VCs pouring into AI field. There's a constant flow of uh, AI startups. But for those of us who are working in the field of AI, this has been a more than 60 years journey, taking multiple generations of scientists and engineers to get where we are today. My own field um, is in AI is a combination of computer vision and uh, machine learning. Um, just about three decades ago, the state of the heart computer vision algorithm were barely recognizing lines and edges in pictures. And fast forward, to the beginning of the second decade of the 21st century, computers are beginning to recognize everyday objects almost as well as humans do. And, and today, we even have computers that can learn to write descriptions of entire sentences in grammatically correct English to describe what they see. So many ask, what have driven the progress of AI in such rapid speed? And there are many good ways to answer this, but as a technologist, I would att uh, attribute three important technological factors. First is compute, or hardware. Smaller, better, faster chips, making large-scale computing more and more efficient and cost-effective is one of the most important um, uh, driving force of the growth of AI. Then algorithms. Algorithms have advanced considerably over the past couple of decades. Machine learning is a field, a relatively young field, born out of statistics and computer science. And in particular, algorithms based on neural network and their many forms have enjoyed 
a renaissance and undergoing enormous development. So that's a second ingredient for AI. And uh, finally, also the age of big data has given intelligent systems access to more training examples than researchers in previous generations could have even imagined. And uh, especially in the field of visual videos and, and uh, images have, um, have become, s uh, the, the amount of this data have become so enormous to really um, enable the rapid growth and development of algorithms. So um, here's an example in industry. With this convergence of the three forces, compute, algorithms, and data, AI really has taken off around the beginning of the second decade of 21st century, so after 2010-2012. Google is, uh, can serve as a living example of this trend. As recent as 2012, deep learning played almost no role across Google's main product lines. But by 2015, however, its influence was everywhere. Today, the company proudly refers itself as AI first. So in only a little more than half a decade, AI has transformed the world's largest tech company. What should we expect in the next half decade or beyond? Applications for AI are em emerging from healthcare to retail, media and entertainment to transportation, and many, and many areas beyond. Many call this the current period, the fourth industrial revolution we're living in, and AI is clearly among its drivers. So much is changing. Software is transitioning from rigid rule-based to learning systems driven from data. Infrastructure is becoming increasingly autonomous. And the very notion of what it meant to be human was soon to be challenged in the age of autonomous machines. But as I said at the beginning of this talk, I do remind myself and my students, there is nothing artificial about AI. After all, AI is a field made by the people with the goal to develop machines resemble the behaviors of people and for the purpose of helping people. So whether we're thinking about the next generation AI technology or we're paying attention to the real massive societal impact of AI, it is time for us to think deeply about the human connection and implications of AI. And this is what I call human-centered AI. And I want to share with you what I think it consists of, three simple and powerful ideas. So first, AI must be more inspired by human intelligence. Today's algorithms are remarkably capable but they've only scratched the surface of the depth of our own perception and in intelligence. If we really want our technology to understand our needs and to contribute to our well-being, we must close this gap further. And when AI better understands us, it will tend to work more naturally with us as well. This will enable the second pillar, which is AI and technology that enhance us rather than replace us. And finally, the entire science of AI, from research and development uh, to development, must be guided by a concern for its impact on us human beings. So let's begin with the first item. AI must be more inspired by human intelligence. Oh, sorry, I forgot to click. Oh, well. <laughs> These are the three pillars of human-centered AI. We'll start, with the, we'll start with the first one, uh, the need for AI to better incorporate the depth and flexibility of our own intelligence as humans. 
To understand how machines and human intellects compare, let's continue to use vision as an example. As we mentioned above, computer vision is a subfield of AI. The goal is to teach computers to learn to see. Vision is an integral part of how we reason and understand the world, from the physical world to the abstract. And nearly half of the brain plays a role in visual intelligence. So to tr truly understand um, the contents of a visual scene, enormous amount of depth and subtlety are required. After 540 million years of evo uh, evolution, humans have become remarkably advanced uh, in visual intelligence. So how rich is human vision exactly? That was actually a question I asked myself when I was a graduate student. And we did an experiment of showing human subjects everyday pictures like this. But we controlled the amount of time people were able to see, this, uh, see an image like this. And we asked them what they see. We want to know when we're limiting the amount of the time the pictures are exposed to human subjects, how much can the visual system um, fully understand the visual scene? And the finding was pretty remarkable. For if we present the picture for only 40 milliseconds, that is 1 25th of a second, people are already starting to see the gist of the visual scene, like it's an outdoor scene, and maybe it's a farm. Not much uh, happens at four, uh, uh, there isn't much beyond that, but still there's this general sense. Then 80 millisecond, uh, our human subject sees two people in the center of the scene. By 107 millisecond, that's about the amount of time what the eye makes a movement, well, our human subject can, re, uh, can see people are playing rugby, two people in close contacts, wrestling on grass, another man is more distant, there is a goal in sight. So there are slight mistakes, but still, it's a remarkable um, a feat of the visual system to see this much in such a short time. And by the time it's 500 milliseconds, that's half of a second, literally a split of a second. It's almost like eternity. Um, you know, we pay them $10 an hour to write what they see. I, I always wonder if we pay more, are they gonna write more? But people, people are starting to write uh, paragraphs of the whole scene. Not only they see objects like people and uh, and the ground and, and the scenery, they also see the activities like fist in the face and they get the emotion, there is a rough game and, and, and so on. So this experiment tells us how rich human, um, human perception is. And, uh, <laughs> but in fact, that wasn't even enough. That experiment just tells us all the things we can describe, but there's more goes to visual understanding. So um, we have this, we have an astonishing capability to glean context and piece together stories of an image without any further guidance. Let's take this image as an example, right? Um, today's technology would have no problem tagging the objects, a dog, a couch, a person, coffee cup, and so on. A captioning system, the best captioning system, might even be able to say that there is a dog sitting on a couch in a room. But as people, we have access to far more interesting layer of the information. Not only we can immediately tell the couch is damaged, but we can safely bet the dog is responsible for it. And we can tell based on a slight change of posture that the owner is pretty upset. And uh, perhaps best of all, we can even feel that the dog is guilty, or at least we are assuming the dog is feeling guilty. So we can see causal relationships across time. We sense emotion and feel a sub subjective response of our own, perhaps ranging from sympathy to amusement. 
So it's clear that today's AI cannot do that. And uh, our algorithm have a long way to go before they can understand the world on a level that even the, uh, comes close to our own. So this ability is made, this human ability, is made possible by our remarkable ability to combine the information presented by our senses with a deep understanding of context, situational awareness, as well as an ability to associate what experience we experience with prior knowledge about the world. But compared to this amazing human ability, machines are far simpler and narrow. This brings me to a quote that was first used in the 1970s to describe the state of the uh, AI technology 40 years ago. But I hope you would agree it still runs true today. And the quote is, the definition of today's AI is a machine that can make a perfect chess move or go move while the room is on fire. It speaks of that narrow ability that our technology uh, has. So to truly draw from the depth and complexity of human intelligence, we need more than just computer science. Artificial intelligence is increasingly a multidisciplinary field, drawing from neuroscience, cognitive science, and many more. Here, I want to draw two historical examples to highlight how neuroscience and cognitive science have had profound impact in the development of AI. First example is AI and neuroscience. So in the 50s, there were two neuroscientists, Hubel and Wiesel. They were working in Harvard, and they want to ask the question, explore how cats or mammals see the complex visual world. So they did their famous um, cat um, um, experiment to test how uh, the cat's primary visual cortex respond to visual stimulus. Without getting into the details, after many trials and, um, and error, they find out that the early layers of cat visual cortex respond to oriented edges. And in fact, they deduced using experimental data that the whole cat visual system is layered from simple uh, cells that respond to simple edge-like patterns to complex cells and beyond that respond to more and more complex patterns. And uh, that formed the basis of our understanding of the mammalian visual system. And for this work, Hubel and Wiesel won the Nobel, Pri uh, Nobel Medicine Prize in 1980s. But this work deeply inspired today's neural network, or what we call deep learning algorithms. Even though neural deep learning is not trying to replicate what the brain does, but we draw inspiration that the basic foundation of a neural network um, model, it, the basic unit is a neuron-like node that takes inputs from other nodes and send output to others, and it's layered in hierarchical fashion. So this is a, a profound example to show the deep connection between an early neuroscience work with today's uh, AI algorithm. And we all know since the blossoming of deep learning, many, many fields, subfields in AI has benefited from that. And we've seen a lot of success story, whether in computer vision, speech, uh, healthcare, uh, um, energy optimization, and so on. So I want to also um, share with you another uh, story that connects AI to cognitive science. And, uh, and this story is more dear to my own heart. As you, many of you might know, about 10 years ago, my students and I worked on a project called ImageNet. And the goal for um, creating ImageNet is to reset the way we train machine learning algorithms and to enable machine learning algorithms with the kind of uh, the quantity and quality of training data 
humans' experience in their development. And uh, ImageNet is a data set of almost uh, more than 14 million images um, hand-labeled by uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk workers organized in 22 categ categories. But, um, uh, and in the, in the years following the release of ImageNet, it was used to train increasingly sophisticated algorithms and it has been one of the driving forces in the progress of computer vision. And uh, our group also have held an international in, in ImageNet competition since 2010. And as you can see, the error rate of, of the best algorithms of ImageNet competition has steadily increased as our machine learning algorithm improved by the time it's uh, is uh, recent years, it has, it's been as good as human performance. But the often unappreciated part of ImageNet and deep learning story is, which I want to tell more and more people, is the inspiration from cognitive psychologist, Professor George Miller from Princeton University. Professor George Miller is a cognitive scientist as well as a linguist. He thinks deeply about language, semantics, and the ontological structure of lexicons. After decades of work, he created an enormous lexical data set uh, that organized English language in a structured map of semantic ideas, and he called it WordNet. And it was essentially a dictionary organized as a graph in which each word is connected to related words in a hierarchical fashion. And uh, when my students and I wanted to um, depict the world, uh, visual world with meaning, we, at the beginning, we didn't know where to even begin to think about it. You know, we can always pull words out of our head, but that's not a very structured way of doing that. And very luckily, we learned about WordNet. And we, as we read more and more about the cognitive science behind WordNet, we recognize that uh, that should be the <coughs> backbone of ImageNet because WordNet, whether it's perfect or not, is one of the best ways to organize meaning in the world. And uh, that was the beginning of ImageNet. Um, so for every node that is visualizable in WordNet, we um, describe it with thousands of images we can find of variety, uh, 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 variety appearances. And, uh, and again, I just, it's fair to say that without the inspiration and pioneering work of Professor George Miller and his colleagues, it might very likely take us way longer to develop ImageNet, uh, which might in turn impact the progress of AI. So again, the spark of science happened at the intersection of AI and cognitive science. Um, but despite these accomplishments, today's AI can only <coughs> still is nascent, and there's considerable challenges remain. Just to name a few, for example, robots, are starting to demonstrate great dexterity and precision than ever, but they still stumble quickly when their environment is unstructured and there are changes in unexpected ways. Babies still learn with remarkable flexibility and speed, often with just a few or single example without much supervision. And it doesn't take much time with the even even the best conversational agents to run into the limits of their com uh, comprehension. Algorithms have a long way to go before they become adequate conversation partners for humans. And um, so many of my colleagues and labs worldwide are now working on next generation AI technology. Here's just a couple of examples from my own lab beyond the work of WordNet, we start to think deeply about what it takes in our next step to connect vision and language and to go deeper than just being able to name isolated objects in a scene. 
This is the work we call Visual Genome, which is a compositional data set connecting vision and language and trying to describe relationships between, between objects. Really, our goal, ultimate goal of a work like Visual Genome is to be able to describe that dog on the couch scene with much better, um, um, with much richer description and understanding. And uh, for those of you who are vision students in the audience, we've been exploring the structure of scene graph and trying to use scene graph to answer questions like visual relationship understanding, dense captioning, and even um, question and answers based on visual information. This is not a technical talk, so I'm not going to get into equations, but I just want to show some of the current thinking. And uh, also in a slightly different work, uh, I start to work with computational cognitive scientists to develop algorithms that is inspired to learn the way babies explore objects in the environment. On the left is an image of a virtual agent um, uh, living in a 3D environment with simulated physical laws. It can see its environment, exert force, on uh, nearby objects and observe the results. On the right is an architecture that allows it to use this experiments, uh, experiences to form an increasingly detailed understanding of the world and to, understand, to, to explore the world like an infant playing with toys and learn about physical interactions. And most import importantly, it does it in a spontaneous way without direct supervision. But these are all explore, uh, explorations, and they're only at the beginning. Um, what I would <coughs> just want to say is that AI is so nascent, there is a much greater need for interaction between AI, neuroscience, cognitive science, and many other disciplines to create the next generation AI technology that is inspired by the flexibility, the depth, and the richness of human intelligence. And this is the first pillar of human-centered AI. Now, this brings us to the next point. What is this technology for? And how do we want to use it? When it comes to AI discussion, a major concern of the future is jobs and job displacement. A recent McKinsey report concluded that half of all current work activities can be theoretically automated by existing technology. In other words, even without further advances in the field, AI is already capable of significant job disruption. This is an alarming fact, and there is no denying that the coming decades will bring many labor-related challenges. But I also want to remind us this might be only half of the story. I also believe that everything we do as humans can be potentially enhanced by intelligent technology. From manual labor to creative tasks like design and even scientific research, AI has potential to change the way we work in an assistive, augmenting, enhancing, and helpful way. So while it's vital that we mitigate threats like job displacement, which we will talk about in the third pillar, it's, um, it's equally vital that we recognize opportunities to improve the way we work using AI technology. And the key word I would like everybody to think about is, instead of thinking about replacement, think about enhancement. So healthcare is among my favorite example of what the future of AI could look like for all of us. Nurses and doctors are critical and essential to the healthcare of our patients. Much of their value comes from the human strength, like seeing useful connections uh, in unpredicted situations, collaborating uh, intuitively with colleagues and communicating and helping with empathy and warmth. Um, at the same time, however, being human, some part of their work is also error prone, such as maintaining regular hand hygiene and patient monitoring 24-7. Unfortunately, 
while it's unrealistic to expect any human practitioners to maintain 100% consistency in such tasks, the impact of even a brief lapse can be devastating. Here are two sobering examples. Each year in America alone, hospital-acquired infection takes more than 90,000 lives, three times more than car accidents. And for elders, the injuries caused by falling alone cost $36 billion of healthcare uh, resource and lives. So this is where the limitations of human caretakers become clear and where the complementary value of AI emerges. So in a collaboration with Stanford Children's Hospital, my colleagues and students have begun a project exploring the utility of smart sensors and AI algorithms to help reminding clinicians to practice better hand hygiene activity, hoping to provide real-time reminder in the future when there is a lapse of attention. And some of you might recognize the sensors we use are the depth sensors uh, we put across a hospital uh, unit that preserves privacy of our clinicians, yet help to recognize human activities. Here's an example in a collaboration with a senior home facility in San Francisco called Unlock. We're exploring a project that helped clinicians to observe behaviors of aging seniors living in semi-independent living environments. Our hope is that these non-invasive continuous sensors will provide valuable information, feedback, and time-sensitive alert to clinicians and family members to assist seniors in, um, in, um, um, in needs and in emergency. Some part of the doctor job is also repetitive and labor intensive. Take radiology as an example. The majority of the data they see in a given day requires only a cursory analysis to tell the patient everything they need to know. Unfortunately, are we humans are notoriously bad at maintaining consistent results under such um, repetitive, exhausting circumstances. So with Google colleagues, we have developed an algorithm that automates initial analysis of some X-ray data, quickly identifying features of interest and pointing the radiologist in, in the right direction. This helps take human errors out of the equation while saving time. As a res result, radiologists can spend more of their time analyzing cases that requires the full range of human knowledge, awareness, and perception. And in each of the cases, AI is being used to improve the services and care delivered by human specialists, not meaning to replace them. By lowering cost, increasing safety, caretakers will have more time to focus on the people in their charge. Hospitals will save money and patients will enjoy greater quality of care. And there are more promising examples of AI enhancing humans on the way. We're already seeing examples of human and technology can complement each other in Da Vinci robotic surgical systems that allows uh, the precision and power of a machine to merge with the knowledge, expertise, and instincts of a human surgeon. Um, reinforcement learning has been very prominent in recent years. My colleague at Stanford, Emma Brunskill, is leading very interesting research into the application of using uh, reinforcement, learning reinforcement learning technology to process, uh, to understand and assist the process of education with children. And there are also situations where we'd love to take human out of the harm's way. Stanford's Ocean One robot is already exploring the ocean at depth too dangerous for human divers. And the day will soon come when intelligent machines can replace humans, human first responders in the most extreme disaster zones. In both 
exploration and disaster aid, human participation will remain essential, but AI will make it possible for researchers and first responders alike to focus on the task and then make the best use of their creativity, strategy, and emotional intelligence instead of putting their lives at risk. Even scientists themselves will find the nature of their work changed by the emergence of smarter algorithms. There is a very recently published Nature article on how a set of deep learning algorithms were trained to help chemists to discover optimal steps used in drug candidate synthesis, a traditionally time and resource intensive uh, part of the work of chemists. And the machines only needed six seconds to accomplish this. And uh, finally, the relationship between man and machine will become richer and more intertwined. Stanford's Jack Rabbit project represents some of the latest research into robots that exhibit, exhibits awareness of social norm, expectations, and etiquette. Among its unique skills include the ability to gracefully navigate crowded space. So in summary, I'm excited by AI's potential to work with humans to enhance, augment our capabilities to help us to work more productively, live safer, healthier, and help each other better. But as technologists, with all members of our society, along with all members of our society, we also have a collective responsibility to understand and guide AI's impact to our society. The development of AI must be guided by a concern for human impact. Little is understood about AI's interactions and impact at the societal level at the mo moment. Truly understanding this will require the input from many disciplines, including philosophy, ethics, economics, laws, social sciences, and many other fields, uh, to help us to navigate the challenges of AI. One challenge is AI and labor. As we spoke about, AI will have a fundamental impact in, uh, in um, our workforce and we need to be prepared for this. The recent McKinsey report on AI and the future of work finds that full employment will remain possible through 2030. While this is encouraging, however, we must remember that unprecedented changes lie ahead, even the, in the best case scenario. How do we navigate the transition between now and the world of 2030 will have far-reaching effects, and the time is to begin preparing now. McKinsey ends its report by suggesting four key measures to scale job training programs, to support job creation through economic growth, to improve labor market dynamism, and to provide income and tr transition support to workers. Clearly, more research and work needs to be done in this area. There's also AI and privacy. Our society also has to confront the way that technology should be used in public life. Are we ready for a world in which everyone can be automatically re recognized and at any time? What would this mean for our notion of privacy and identity? AI and cybersecurity. In the world of cyber warfare and hacking, AI threatens to make cyber attacks cheaper, more effective, and more scalable. AI will also make new kinds of attacks possible. For example, voice synthesis is quickly reaching both sophistication and accessibility needed for even common hackers to convincingly fabricate a voicemail or phone conversation from a trusted source. As for the AI systems themselves, they're vulnerable in ways that traditional software is not, including data poisoning, manipulating training data to ensure the resulting system makes specific kind of mistakes or adversarial examples. 
If we truly want such system to play a role in our society, we must make sure they're secure and make this a top priority. Bias in AI is not a theoretical concern. A great deal of reporting has already been done on real cases of machine learning tools in fields like finance and criminal justice that exhibit frightening lopsided behavior. And it's likely this problem is only just beginning. Now is the time to understand this problem and take steps towards reforming it before it gets worse. The problem often begins with data. Here's what I call the grandma problem. Type the word grandma in your favorite image search engine and look at the result. Notice anything? This may seem lighthearted, but when the data that underlies the entire internet is this homogenous, it can have a devast the devastating effect on communities all over the world. Researchers from UCLA have put considerable effort into studying the datasets used to train algorithms and quantifying the bias they, they contain. And look at this sexist assumption of visual understanding of a scene. Even though in terms of the pixel um, comparison, they're very, very similar pictures, yet for the girl, the algorithm labels it as woman cooking, whereas for the boy, the algorithm labels it as men fixing faucet. <laughs> but it's heartening to know that the machine learning community is already working on early steps towards correcting this problem, but much work remains to be done. Next, the very creators of AI algorithms are reflecting a lack of diversity and bias in their demography. I will be blunt here, diversity is sorely lacking in the world of computing, and it includes AI. The American National Science Foundation reported in 2016 that fewer than 30% computer science majors are women, and a similar study show that fewer than 15% are left by the time they reach professorship. Similar numbers are found across most of Silicon Valley's tech companies, and the statistics of racial minority groups are even worse. If, the tech, if this technology is going to change our lives, our society, and perhaps even the entire future of humanity, and I sometimes I do believe it will, then this lack of representation is an absolute crisis. This is a recent <laughs> panel discussion of future of AI. There are many respected AI technologists on this panel, but still, I think some of you might notice something is missing in this picture. So diversity in AI research and development can be very clearly connected with the outcome. It's people, ultimately, who oversee the most important decisions. The developers who write algorithms and design models are impacting how the model behaves. Those who collect data that train the model have a direct impact on how the model sees the world, including its blind spots and lapses in perception. As its worst, incomplete training data often leads to misunderstanding of people at the level of age, race, gender, income, and many other uh, factors. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, management is responsible for which problems are solved in the first place. It's not hard to imagine that a lack of diversity at the level of decision making will result in a lopsided vision of which problems need to be solved in the first place. AI is also changing our culture. We see it in the difference between the way that parents and children interact with smart home assistants. Parents tend to couch their requests with please and thank you, while teenagers in this generation um, makes, doesn't think it's necessary. 
This is a funny example, but it's a testament of how sensitive culture is to even a hint of machine intelligence. How much can we expect culture to change as this technology gets smarter? Are we prepared for it? How are we pre 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 prepared for it? So, having listed some of the biggest challenges AI will bring to our society, what should we do? What can we actually do about this? Well, first of all, academia has a huge role to play. Universities are uniquely positioned to lead the transition to a cross-disciplinary AI future. Uh, current campuses mostly separate computer science from other fields like humanities and social sciences. But this doesn't need to be the case. We should encourage for far more interdisciplinary collaborations across departments and schools, but in the form of classes, seminars, programs, degrees, centers, joint product, uh, projects, and so on. Governments worldwide also has a role to play. For one thing, I think there needs to be an increase of scientific basic science funding. AI as a scientific field is still very nascent. Government funding will ensure more fair, transparent and creative development of AI and its related interdisciplinary research. This is critical for our society, our students and our shared future. It's also critical for combating the current trend of one, direction, one directional talent flow from academia to industry. Science knows no borders, neither should its benefits. Citizens of every nation should feel entitled to share AI's potential to increase quality of life. Governments have a role in safeguarding this entitlement for their people. We should view AI as an opportunity for global cooperation, not just competition. We've seen how international cooperation can work, such as in nuclear disarmament, working to avoid infectious uh, diseases, or fighting climate change. And government also has a strong role to play in encouraging STEM education, especially among underrepresented groups. Diversity is important for its own sake, but it's especially important in AI. The challenge of engineer, uh, we need all of the talents we can get to address the complexity of next generation AI. And AI will be embodying its creators. Of course, I'm not the only one calling for this kind of government support. Many countries have established AI policies of their own in recent years. These are significant steps that should be praised, but much more can be done and we should encourage this trend to continue. Finally, this change must extend to the corporate world, where the tech giants are dedicating staggering amount of resources to the development of intelligent algorithms. While such aggressive investment promises rapid advances, the time has come to complement it with ethical AI policies that temper ambition with responsibility. As the commercial potential of this technology skyrockets, we must remember its impact is ultimately felt by our employees, our users, and our community and society. It's imperative that corporations remain in open dialogue with academia, nonprofits, and governments to encourage the study of AI's human impact. Ultimately, it's their products that will change the world, and it's their data and perspective that will prove most valuable in determining whether its outcome is positive or negative. Sharing this with outside group is the best way to ensure we guide this technology <coughs> responsibly. I'm happy to say there are encouraging signs. At Google, I've seen many examples of AI being used to solve problems related to human well-being, wildlife, and the environment. 
these lie well beyond any immediate commercial gain, but make real differences in lives of people they touch. For instance, machine learning algorithms that Google developed has helped improve breast cancer detection, has helped to precisely search in aerial photos to track the population of endangered sea cows. And even can we have, Googlers have used facial recognition algorithms to help quantify gender bias in Hollywood casting. There, there clearly can be more of such work. And the future is exciting. AI isn't just another technology. More than, uh, more than anything we've created, it's a reflection of ourselves. This is why it's so important that everyone has a chance to contribute. There are many policies we should consider if we want to ensure a brighter future. But I personally believe one in particular is the most important, is to make AI accessible to everyone. This technology will likely play an even bigger role than we can imagine in the world of tomorrow. That means time is now to ensure the next generation of leaders, scientists, and policymakers have every opportunity to get involved. Regardless of race, gender, geography, income, every young person should feel encouraged to participate. This is this, more than anything else, is how we can ensure AI makes a positive impact on our society. So together with my colleagues and friends at Stanford and Princeton, we've created AI for All, a nonprofit organization focusing on increasing diversity and inclusion in AI through educational programs. We target high school students and, in, uh, and invite them to take summer camps in different campuses throughout North American um, uh, universities. In 2018, we have six participating universities, Stanford, Berkeley, Princeton, Simon Fraser University, Carnegie Mellon University, and Boston University. And our goal is to engage in more campuses worldwide uh, hopefully at Oxford in the not so distant future. As our motto of AI for All says, AI will change the world. The real question is, who will change AI? And this is what we're all working on at AI for All. So, in conclusion, um, as a powerful technology, like AI, continue shaping our society and future, we have many reasons to be cautious, but this should not be at the expense of our, our optimism. And because we foresee such a complex future, we have a special obligation to face it together. In short, we can't do this without each other, all of us. After all, no matter how autonomous AI becomes, its impact on human life will always be our responsibility. And this is what makes AI human-centered. Thank you.
a gendered approach which I saw worked very well in a recent uh, set of questions. So you will forgive me if I don't take uh, male question after male question after male question. So, Julian, would you like to start? Thanks very much. Um, my name's Julian Sabers. I'm the Professor of Practical Ethics. So I was, I was wondering, you talked a little bit about AI identifying racial and gender bias, but I wondered whether you could reflect a bit more broadly about the potential of AI to improve human moral decision making and also to undermine human moral decision making. So, um First of all, thank you. This is a really important question. And also, I have to admit, I'm more a technologist than a social scientist. So um, my knowledge and understanding is limited. Uh, in terms of AI undermining uh, human moral decision making, um, a lot of this is already reflected in the AI systems that is trying to assist uh, decision making, for example, in courtrooms or in medicine and potentially in education, when the data is biased, when the system lacks the awareness of the biased data, um, AI's outcome, the predicted result, could be inherently biased. We have seen this um, in courtroom where a lot of data, training data of certain kind of um, crime, let's say, come from a certain racial group it'll bias the decision making to the future uh, decision when a member of that racial group comes, um, comes in regardless of the actual evidence. Uh, we have seen this in medicine. Suppose a disease is trained, let's say, by a, by a certain racial group of patients, then a different uh, racial group um, patient's data will come in and the, the system might have a harder time giving the right decision. So a lot of this current uh, bias is related to the bias in data. Um, in terms of your first half of the question is enhancing. enhancing in a positive way, right? Well, the hope is that uh, humans are subjective agencies. Humans also have our own flaws in terms of attention lapse, in terms of exhaust, in terms of lack of holistic knowledge sometimes. If machine learning serves human purpose in the objective way that we hope it does, it lacks the kind of subjectivity. For example, in our hospital example where we are using smart sensors to track hand hygiene performance, this is a century old problem. And currently the hospitals that are checking hand hygiene practice sends secret human shoppers to stand by the corridors of the hospital um, uh, units and take notes of the, of the hand hygiene practice. And this is extremely biased. You know, humans, if you know your friends are walking by, you don't, you know, you have a different way of taking notes and, and also if you're hungry or tired and so on. Whereas our 24 seven AI smart sensor system is just, it's just completely continuous and unbiased. So that's a positive way of, of showing that effect. Don't let me down here, please, ladies. <laughs> and thank you. I'm delighted to, to see you as a, as a woman uh, speaking so authoritatively in this field. But you commented on the, the low percentage of women going into computer science. Is there anything in your own experience that would suggest ways that we could encourage them? Yeah, thank you for asking that question. I think how we improve the, the percentage of women and underrepresented minority in CS and AI is kind of a million dollar question so many people ask. So let me speak about AI for All. AI for All started about four years ago with my former student, uh, currently Professor Olga Rusakovsky at uh, Princeton. And we thought hard about the, the lack of women in AI, and we thought of hard about our education of AI. And we recognized one factor that was very salient, 
at least in Silicon Valley, when we talk about AI and tech, there's this coolness factor. Tech is cool, tech is geek is cool. But we don't talk as much as about the human mission of technology. We don't, in, we don't inspire our students about the, 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 the impact, the human impact that technology can bring. We tend to ins try to inspire students about the coolness of math and coding, which is good, but they miss this. Um, the other demography, and we notice when students come from a broader spectrum of walks of life, like women and other students, they tend to have a awareness of the need for human mission. So AI for All as an education program was um, built upon this hypothesis that let's teach and inspire AI to young high school students with a human-centered <coughs> approach. And so far we find this extremely heartening to see when our uh, Stanford, <laughs> we focused on girls, Berkeley, we focus on low-income students, and Princeton, we're focusing on racial minorities. When the students connect a technology with human meaning and mission, they really respond well. So at least that's one factor we're trying to uh, work on. Well, in, not far from here, in London, DeepMind as one of the most uh, remarkable AI institute is uh, doing everything by playing games, right? <laughs> Developing AI. So I think playing is, uh, is part of the AI. Um, you know, a lot of people are thinking about playing as a way to train AI algorithms. I understand your type of playing is different from playing video games and playing Go. So the work we just showed, um, uh, um, the 2018 work, we tried to uh, 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 develop an algorithm that explore by curiosity, like a baby, is a literally a baby step towards that. And there are other researchers thinking in similar ways, is not go-oriented or supervised training, but curiosity-based exploration. Uh, I was very interested to see uh, that you had in the year 2018 uh, the fact that it's only a French flag that appeared, and uh, the project of Macron, yes. which is very much spoken of in France, as you can hear, I have slightly prejudice because. But I also live at Stanford University, what a prof. My husband was a scientist, and I saw the, the birth of Silicon Valley in the late 60s and all that. And I, I'm deeply uh, worried about this country that seems to uh, take a, a long time to, to see what is this tsunami of this revolution by AI and to react in the splendid way that you have explained, you know, the various possibilities and I wish you all the best for your <laughs> organization and I think I will look at it and maybe uh, give a little bit of money for that. But thank you so much. <laughs> so, so I uh, could, like you, could you say also, do you think that the fact that Macron is now with Donald Trump, <laughs> you could you discuss that and do you have any way to influence that? <laughs> <laughs> I do want to defend UK a little bit. UK 
as being a leader in AI, not only in its basic research. I mean, AlphaGo is an inspirational event that came out of UK. And sitting in the audience, we have some leaders of UK uh, AI um, development, uh, Professor Andrew Blake, Professor Andrew Zissman. These are all the leaders that are world stage as well as leading U uh, England's uh, AI development. So I feel very optimistic about England. So. <laughs> Question on your second point. Um, I know that it's really exciting all the medical examples you gave, but uh, some of us in computer vision have noticed in CDPR and other conferences we attend, there's a disproportionate representation of just autonomous driving startups trying to recruit us. So can you talk about more from the technolo technology, from your perspective, um, besides the McKinsey suggestions for how to kind of create more incentives for mitigating um, automation, what your thoughts would be, and maybe even changing the incentives for um, us entering the field. Right, so um, I think I mean, I'm not the one, there's a famous, uh, I forgot who is the speaker, but there's a famous TED talk on why autonomous uh, vehicle is ripe as a, you know, t technology and <coughs> why being a huge market, why there's every single gi tech giant is racing, uh, you know, with the traditional car makers, with the uh, startups. So, so um, I guess your question is most about what are the other fields that computer vision and, and AI, um, human enhancing AI technology can, can make a difference. So one thing that wearing the hat of Google Cloud chief scientist in AI and machine learning, I'm very fortunate to work with almost every vertical under the sun. It's, uh, there is, you know, not only healthcare, there's manufacturing, there's retail, there is um, agriculture, there is energy, uh, oil, there is uh, entertainment. So every, or education, so every industry we can think of right now is actually um, starting to transform in the digital and AI age and think about use cases. And there is just, McKinsey also just recently, last week, released um, how many, like 400 or whatever, how many hundred case studies of AI's application in different vertical industries. It, the, the field is still very green, but it's enormous. It's not just self-driving cars. One, one, sorry, one here, please. And then, actually, I don't know. Which one? Mine. <laughs> 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 uh, when uh, Google's DeepMind played Go against the, uh, the Go champion, the champion said that he, but he uh, AlphaGo did a move that he'd never seen before out of any uh, person he'd ever played. So that's AI eclipsing human's ability for imagination and faculty. Does that not really scare you? <laughs> um, and you think enough work has been done to evaluate the psychological effects that that might have on the human race? So, so, so as my um, pillar three has suggested, AI's deep impact on human race, not only just um, social job, economical impact, but also the challenge of being human itself is something that I think it's, it's, it's really worth us paying attention to. The particular example you mentioned about uh, AlphaGo's move, I think it was in like game three or something, um, that particular move didn't scare me because uh, um, again, that was more a computational creativity in a very limited um, um, rule space that, uh, um, that if you know anything about Martin Kahlo's search tree and, and reinforcement learning, you wouldn't be surprised that an algorithm could potentially come up with something that human brain cannot because we're just fundamentally differently wired. It's, 
we might not be able to have that computational capacity like um, AlphaGo did. So, but whether it's that inspiration or not, this human implication uh, in the age of technology and intelligent machines, I think it's a really fair question. That's why even at Stanford, we start to talk to philosophers, talk to ethicists, talk to anthropologists about being human, being intelligent. So I, I do want to encourage more of this kind of cross-disciplinary studies. Um, so in machine learning, there's a huge focus on benchmarks and these huge data sets that you've been talking about. And as the previous question actually is an example, it's always the research that achieves very high level performance or like superhuman performance that gets all the attention. But what you actually mentioned is flexibility and generality is actually what is most impressive about how humans think. So my first question is, how can we encourage researchers to maybe not be so motivated by ego and instead of <laughs> aiming for superhuman performance on these very specific tasks, just aim more at doing okay at the vast range of things that things do? Um, and secondly, kind of related to that, uh, in the real world, when humans are asked a question, there's very rarely a single right answer. You know, when you ask a question, you can tell me about asking another question, you refuse to speak, but these <coughs> data sets, which is what machine learning research is overwhelmingly founded on, um, they tend to focus on a mapping problem, um, where there are a few very, or one very specifically defined answer, and the real world doesn't like that. So how, how do we change data sets and research to uh, improve that? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Are you a PhD student <laughs> trying to graduate and think of that? Uh, I mean, I have to say, if you think about that killer data set, you graduate very soon. <laughs> so it's a very, very, it, it, it's a very important question. A lot of us are seeking the answer. Um, you know, being someone who, um, who worked on I ImageNet, um, sometimes people joke to blame me being one of the key drivers of this, uh, what you call ego-driven, <laughs> performance-driven um, machine learning. I think there's always going to be um, a role that data sets and benchmarks and performance will play, because a lot of scientific research needs to be translatable, benchmarkable, and so on. But that doesn't take away room for explorative research. If you go to NIPS, CVPR, ICML, not every paper is going after ImageNet or whatever the next, uh, the next benchmark is. There is a pretty wide spread of, of ideas. If you ask me as a senior you know, professor when we evaluate um, um, faculty candidate, or evaluate Google research scientists, we don't look at their papers and say, this person's image net challenge number is 3.5, therefore they deserve a faculty position. So, so I think as a community, research community, we do have a respect and recognition of, you know, benchmark is not everything, performance is not everything. That said, we are lacking benchmark and data set right now that can test out flexibility and, and, and deeper, richer understanding. It, it's not easy. I mean, it collectively took the field, computer vision field, 30 years to come to Pascal and ImageNet, right? Like we have to explore. I think right now AI is so hot, everybody, not, not the, the researchers, but there's an expectation <laughs> that we need to come up with something new every other month. That's just not the way. We have to give research time, explore different uh, uh, areas. I, I'm pretty confident we will come up with newer data sets that would answer those questions. Thank you very much uh, for your interesting talk. So um, one of your themes is, of course, human-centered AI. And you mentioned a lot of interesting and beneficial applications of AIs, in, for example, in healthcare. Um, I wanted to know your opinion on sort of a more 
commercial maybe application of AI, um, such as Google's AI technology um, and its applications in uh, military drone um, programs and in military programs in general. Uh, what is your opinion on that? Uh, so, in general, I think. So here's my favorite quote for several years thinking about AI. There is no independent machine values. Machine values are human values. So I think when we think about the application of technology, we should think about what values it um, carries. And it is our human responsibility. And I don't pretend I'm going to speak for humanity or speak for a a university or, or company, I think leaders of every institution and company needs to make their decisions on that and citizens also should have a voice in this. So inevitably technology will be used in ways that some of us might not approve and uh, I hope that we all find our own way to become a responsible citizen in dealing with that, either to provide uh, support to combat that or to um, you know, find ways to guide it or develop benevolent technology. So, so that's my general thoughts on this topic. Hi, thank you very much for this very informative talk. Uh, I was wondering your view, view on the crossways of quantum computing and AI. How is quantum computing likely to impact the progression of AI? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I expect, uh, um, I don't know enough about com quantum computing to speak responsibly, but I expect that AI today is a very compute um, expensive or you know technology and any advances in computing itself will likely to be a positive um, um, force to to advance AI but I really don't know enough details to speak um, you know in more depth I think we've got time for two more questions so I see that that happens well. I'm really sure what the development of uh, artificial intelligence will affect our uh, social inequality. Because the uh, three drivers of AI technology mentioned computational power, uh, advanced algorithm, and the uh, and data sets are largely owned by these, uh, these multinationals. And they even have the capacity to purchase even more of these, these drivers. And, yeah. So what is your question? Sorry. Uh, so what is the... Uh, how do you think the uh, development of uh, AI, artificial uh, AI technologies will, will change the uh, social inequality? Oh, you're saying that if it's already in the hands of big corporations, how is that going to help social in inequality, right? So first of all, like I said, corporations themselves have social responsibility for their employees, users, and communities. So whether they have regardless of the amount of resource they have, they play a role in social equality as well. And we have positive examples, but we also have negative examples. And we need to, we need to continue to ensure our corporations do that. I also have talked about the roles that government and academia can play, right? So um, government has a role to play to ensure fairness, transparency, uh, responsibility. Academia tends to be the most transparent and open source drivers of AI technology and data sets and we need to absolutely encourage that. That's also why I call for more basic science funding for academia. So I think it takes all of us, um, all of us to work on, on that um, to ensure that kind of fairness. Thank you. Uh, I just first like to begin by thanking you for directly addressing the lack of gender and racial diversity that sometimes machine learning or AI goes into. Uh, sort of related to that, um, I was wondering about how you see AI addressing the ethical diversity out there. So I think on a more micro level, 
for example, with self-driving cars, often these algorithms ultimately sometimes have to make a decision about, say, who they harm in the case of an accident um, that they can't prevent. Uh, I'm wondering sort of how scientists are going about including data for that, because ultimately ethics vary tremendously from person. Yeah, so um, you said there's something very interesting. You, you, you wonder how scientists will be making a decision. Um, my point is scientists and technologists alone cannot make such a decision. These are very complex societal human issues. This technology is touching real lives. This is the moment that this technology in its development as well as deployment, we should include experts and, 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 and uh, scholars and thinkers and leaders from all aspects. For example, at Stanford, again, I'm aware of ethicists and engineers working together to, qu uh, to ask the question of um, decision-making in self-driving cars. And um, I'm sure that uh, I don't know much into these self-driving car companies, but I do hope that they're working with ethicists and, and uh, governments on this. So it is important. Technologists need to recognize that we need to have a deeper and wider dialogue with social scientists, humanists, policy makers, and vice versa. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we could be here for some time more. And I'm afraid we will probably need to bring this to an end now. Um, my apologies in my peripheral vision, as I didn't understand. Um, I think we've all taken away so much to think about um, and done with the lightness of touch in terms of the, the details of technology, which is very gracious for those of us who aren't, um, who aren't technical experts. I think that perhaps the most exciting and terrifying thing that came out of the discussion is that what AI will do is amplify human capabilities. And that, of course, means it amplifies the human capabilities to work for the good. And as one or two of the questions indicated, it has the potential to amplify capabilities to work not for the good. Um, it is an area which is clearly moving, as, as Professor Lee's demonstrated, at such extraordinary pace that in five years' time, the conversation will be different. And in 10 years' time, we'll wonder how we could have had this conversation today. But I hope you will all join with me in uh, thanking our speaker for an extraordinarily rich and helpful conversation with you.